All right. Today's episode is freaking awesome. And it's actually with one of my closest friends. Her name is Jenny Lynn Griffiths. So Jenny is super passionate about gut health and she's a closet nerd. (laughs) I am so excited to expose her today and just how knowledgeable she is on health. Jenny has taken many high level uh, certifications that I've taken. She's taken many more going really deep into gut health. Um, she'll, you know, she'll share in there. She's constantly reading every book she can get her hands on going to all the conferences, you know, a lot like me. And she is just incredibly knowledgeable about the gut. And so today she's going to lay it out for you. All of the things that you need to know, you need to know about gut health. Okay. Um, she kind of calls it at one point, the center of the universe in our body. Yeah. Really great way to put it. Um, so, um, on the more detailed end of things, we talk about leaky gut, SIBO, candida, autoimmune issues. We talk about how the gut health impacts your mental health, how you show up in life. I mean, it is just like knowledge mom after knowledge mom. And Jenny's just so fun and easy to listen to. So I think you guys are going to get so much out of this episode. Make sure you check out her new membership site. It's guthealthforlife.com. I'll put it in the show notes and follow her on Instagram. And especially if you want information on gut health, follow her on TikTok because she's just dropping it all the time. Her TikTok has gotten pretty popular on gut health information. And it's also Jenny Lynn Fit. That's J-E-N-N-I. L Y N fit. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and jump in. Here is Jenny Lynn Griffiths. All right, guys, this is one of my besties. This is Jenny Lynn Griffiths. I'm so excited to have you on Jenny. Cause I've been telling you forever. I'm like, I know. like, because you've done so much like fitness inspiration and all these things on social media, you know, but I'm like, I don't think anybody really knows how nerdy you are. <laughs> Not really. Super nerdy. Let me get my glasses. Super nerdy. Yeah. 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 Totally. I mean, like, I've always said, you kind of remind me of Ben Greenfield because you were like homeschooled and you're like yeah. super hungry for knowledge. It's like, we were talking about PEMF once and you read like a freaking textbook on it. I did. You no, know, it's like very curious mind. And I'm so excited to talk about gut health with you today because I remember when we first met, we were at that CrossFit OUR gym. Yes. Yes, and I, remember I remember you were going off about something about gut health and how exciting yeah. it was that we figured out this, you know, and so you're super, super passionate about it. You're also yeah. very nerdy, which I appreciate. So am I. Yeah. Same. And so I wanted to start off with, you know, can you tell us why you're so passionate? First of all, before we get into yeah. CEO, Candida, Leaky Gut, like why does this matter to you so much? Yeah, I love that question because so actually how I got into health in general was gut health. So when I was 14, I had major gut issues. And now that I'm aware of everything, I definitely had um, leaky gut and SIBO, but I didn't know this at the time. Right. And none of the doctors that I went to, which by the way, I got sent to probably five different doctors, three of which were GI specialists that took me like five months to get into. So I literally just got passed around and they're like IBS, uh, acid reflux. Like they just kept giving me these diagnoses, which now I know clearly what those are. And most of the time, just so you guys know, if you've been diagnosed with IBS, 80% of the time, it's actually SIBO or candida, just so you know. Um, Cause when they say IBS, it's like irritable bowel syndrome. And you're like, okay, well, why are my bowels irritable? Like, and they're like, we don't know. Exactly. Like, we went to 12 it. years of medical school, but we don't know. And you're like, uh, I feel like there's an answer for this, you know? So again, I was 14. So I just trusted the guy in the lab coat, you know, thinking he would like give me the right direction. And, but part of me, even back then, my intuition was like, something's not right. Like I don't feel like they know what they're talking about. I don't feel like the testing is right. The, they gave me like an MRI, which what is an MRI going to show you with gut? Sorry, but like, it's so stupid. Um, they also did an endoscopy or an endoscopy. So I like swallowed the camera. And so then they were like, oh, it might be acid reflex. I'm like, it seriously was, it just felt like a mad guessing game. And even when I was 14, I was like, this seems like the weirdest process. Like, how does no one know how to help me? Like, so anyway, I was just, I mean, I was, frustrated like to for as an understatement I so just long story short I did go finally to a GI specialist first of all they tried to put me on birth control and antidepressants at 14 years old just thought you should let you know so that's like our medical system just so you guys know I, I hope not to offend anyone but I call it drug dealer school so I like oh you went to a drug dealer okay cool you know like that's literally what they are they're drug dealers at a pharmaceutical level and that's what they're trained in and guess who writes their textbooks the pharmaceutical industry so I'm not trying to be a hater, but I'm just being real. Like you guys can fact check me. I'm not lying about any of yeah, this stuff, you just know, to, just like, to interject and back you up on that. Like I I've had multiple guests who are doctors and they're like, you know, cause I used to get angry. Cause same as you, I'm like, how can you see people with hypothyroidism every single day and not 
just naturally wonder. I wonder why. I oh, know. Yeah. Instead of just doling them out a prescription, like I know yes. what to do and I know we're offending people and I don't care because it's just the nature of how it is right now. And yes. finally, with all, I was like, dude, what the heck? And I was getting so mad. But finally, like somebody said this, like, I think it might've been Dr. Gary Forsman. He's like, just understand. I think it was him. It might not have been, but he's like, just understand what you're asking for. Like if you go to Western medicine, you are basically saying, I would like a prescription. Yes. Surgery. Yes. That's what you're yes. going there for. So yeah. if you're trying to get to root cause of stuff, that's not really what they do. That's so not what they do. Unless so you're a know. functional medicine doctor, which that's right. what they do. Right. But anyway, yeah. Like you understand this is the system. And again, I'm not offending anyone. I'm just telling you, we have lots of friends that are doctors and they confirm this. They're yeah. like, yes, this is why we come to these conferences is to really learn how to help our patients and not just to give them drugs. And then those have side effects. And then you give them more drugs and those have side effects. And it's like, you just play this weird game of like, you know, so I went to a GI specialist. She put me on antibiotics because she thought I had parasites. Right. Um, it's just funny. Cause every symptom I had was like by the book, leaky gut and SIBO, like by the book, everything. And I'm like, I don't know how they didn't pick this up, but to be honest, doctors really are not well-versed in SIBO candida or leaky gut at all. Like at all. The only thing I think they're versed in is maybe like food allergies so they did recommend to me, oh, try getting off, you know, dairy and wheat. Those were like the two maybe good recommendations that I got, yeah. the only two. <laughs> and so I, I did try that. They told me to also get on wheat bran, which is like the worst recommendation wow. ever. It's all carbs and sugar. Because, and anyway, it's just, yeah. but I got, so I got antibiotics. I took a dose of it. I did not feel any better. And so I went back and said, I, I feel no better. She goes, oh, you need a second dose. So she gave me a second dose right after, just so you guys know, antibiotics, one dose kills a third of your gut bacteria. So if you're giving someone two doses back to back, guess what you're doing? Killing two thirds of their gut bacteria. And then it gets worse. I didn't feel better after the second dose. So I go back again and she gives me a third dose, literally three doses back to back. If this was a GI specialist, by the way, anyone that knows anything about gut health knows that that's like obliteration for your gut microbiome, three doses back to back. You literally have just lit a wildfire of the whole forest in your gut bacteria and their chances of rebuilding are like slim. Like I've done a lot of research. If you guys looked up Dr. Michael Ruggio and um, Justin Sonberg, which is a microbiologist, he literally says your microbiome after one dose will never be the same. They can actually rebuild and adapt and stuff, but they actually will never be the same. And so I can only imagine after three doses, what my poor gut bacteria were doing. They were like trying to help me survive. And long story short, obviously, after obliterating your microbiome, I was sick for like four years after that. So I was and on and off. Yeah, go ahead. Not to mention, I'm sure, I'm sure they all talk to you about the emotional connection of stress. Nope. Zero. <laughs> <Trauma>. <laughs> I know now that I know, I mean, obviously we can go into that, but there is a definitely an emotional connection to gut issues because it affects your, your vagal nerve and your vagal nerve definitely affects your whole gut. And I, right. it's funny because now that I tie back and we can go into that later, but I did have a traumatic event happen at 14 that I'm sure spurred all of this. And no, no one ever asked me. They, I mean, they asked me if I wasn't feeling good and I said, no. And they're like, oh, here's an antidepressant. Do you want to put her on Prozac? And I was like, no, I don't want to get on Prozac. Like, and yeah. it's like, that's what we're doing. We're telling 14 year olds to get on antidepressants that have major gut issues. And that's why you're obviously like not feeling well. <laughs> right. And I, I want to say, well, we didn't know back then, but we do know now, but uh, most people, most 14 year olds that are like, ow, my stomach is giving me a bunch of problems and I'm kind of depressed because you're going to feel kind of depressed if you right. can't make neurotransmitters in your gut. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Still today though, like this is still happening all the time, Jenny, because I, I have a 14 year old now yeah. when he was two years ago, when he was 12, he had his first little girlfriend and she was struggling and he kind of let me in on, she had a lot of stuff going on emotionally in her life at home. Nope. Straight to the Adderall. That's what they yep. put her on. Adderall, yep. 14. They put her on Adderall 12, 14 12. years old. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Still going on. It's scary guys. Like it's scary. You really, if I can just encourage anyone like start educating yourself on what prescription drugs actually do and what they are. Just like Google it, literally just Google, what does this do? And you'll be like, they're giving that to my 12 year old methamphetamines. Like, yeah. excuse me, but like, wow, like we're doing, this is my problem. I don't, I feel like they're giving out drugs very irresponsibly. Like, I'm like, okay, if you're going to be a drug dealer, at least be like a responsible drug dealer. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, don't just give like a meth to add and like kids that are 12, like, sorry, but that just, and it's, it's mind. jumping like, to this quote unquote solution without ever asking why the problem happened in the first place. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. So the best way, just a real quick, the best way I've heard functional medicine described versus regular medicine is they said, I love this, this functional medicine doctor told me it. He was like, okay, so let's say you go into the doctor and you have a foot in your shoe. So your shoe is hurt, your foot is hurting. And so they, and they diagnose you, oh, you have a phototis, inflammation of the foot. And they give you a medication for it. And they're like, can't you just take out the rock? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like functional right. medicine is like, let's take out the rocks. So you don't yeah, have the pain exactly. and other medicine is like, let's just give you a drug for the pain and inflammation. Right. Yep. Like, I don't yeah. get it. Like, yeah, why would we not want to solve the problem? Why? Like, right. you know, and that's what they guess what's going to keep like, coming back. Yes. <laughs> inflammation yeah. and pain is going to keep coming back. Yeah. So it's just like, anyway, so that's kind of a basis into my story. So I was sick for about four years after that. I kind of figured out a lot of things by myself at that point. Like I was in high school. So I had to drop out of school for two years, by the way. I was so sick. Every time that I ate, I got excruciating pain. I had to drop, like I would come to school and I'd have to drop out right after lunch because I was literally bent over in pain. And that's like the worst thing for a teenager because I literally had teachers that are like, are you faking it just to get out of school? And I'm like, are, do you think I want to be in this much pain and leave my friends at school oh. and like go home and do nothing for five hours? Like I- it was just so, astounding to see how it worked, you know? Can I highlight that real quick? Because like, this is a problem too, of not believing teenagers, right? Like I know. when Jerem, we thought he had COVID and I took him into the urgent care and they, both the nurse and the doctor insinuated that he was like faking for attention. <laughs> they both had this very strong intuition insinuation of that. And I was looking at them like, are you freaking serious right now? Yeah. So also we need to listen to kids like yes. most often, like why would they make that up out of nowhere? You know, yeah, like I didn't want to be sick. And I know some people think you do it for attention, but you're like, bro, I don't want to drop out of school for two years. Like it's not fun. Trust yeah, me. Yeah. Like, and be totally fun. isolated. Yeah. And, uh, not fun. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, so. it's funny. Cause I would attribute, like, it's funny, everything I believe happens for a reason. And I'm like, so grateful for all this experience now, because it's gotten me to where I am. But that's how I got so much into like books and reading is I just like was home alone a lot. You know what I mean? So yeah. I started reading myself on books and podcasts. And I mean, by the time I graduated high school, I had at least figured out enough to where I was like, well, like I got on the dance team, I had like a normal high school career, I'd say, you know, um, because I figured out what foods went with me. I definitely, I started eliminating grains at, at, at that age. I figured out that that helped, you know, okay. um, I, I started limiting dairy. Like I didn't do any milk. I did some cheeses though. So it's stuff that I kind of figured out intuitively, but still right. had like no guidance whatsoever, like literally right. nothing. And I'm a high schooler figuring it out when I've just been to a GI specialist that went to right. GI school. Like I just was like mind blown yeah. that they couldn't figure this out. So then it kind of set me in my career of, I became a trainer. I trained people for a while, did bodybuilding for a while, learned a bunch of other things with that as far as like really like hurting your body is hormonally and like what not to do with dieting. And mm -hmm. you know what I mean? To chronic cardio, it's kind of the classic bodybuilding that, you know, yeah. too much cardio, too little calories for too long, lost my period, got amnorrhea for a year. I did not have a period for a year. Which I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it was kind of nice because I was like, sweet, I don't like go around <laughs> like plan for it, you know. But at the same time, you have to realize that fertility is an optimal sign of health. If right. you don't have fertility, there's a reason. Nature is like, no, you can't procreate because you're right. not good yourself. Like you right. you don't have enough body fat to support a child. How could we give you a child right now? So you just lose your right. period. Yeah, you know, it it's is like it's like beyond a red flag. And it is like yes. a siren for women. So, <laughs> yeah. And so women, like if you are losing, and the funny thing is I told my coaches, like, I was like, I don't have a period. And they're like, oh, that's normal. That's just normal. Like, you know, like just discounted it completely. Guys, if you don't have a period, that's, that is a red flag. Like you need to figure out what's going on because oh, yeah. your body is, and, and not even if you want to get pregnant just for your health, like you should sure. menstruate every month. That's a sign of being in tune and you have rhythms all in your body, especially women. We have this 28 to 32 day cycle that's supposed to be there with the moon and everything. And it's like, if you're ignoring that stuff, you know, that and circadian rhythm, like you're not going to be in alignment with your health and life, you know? Totally. Amen. Okay. So, so you do the whole bodybuilding thing and like, where do you go from there with gut stuff? Yeah. So then it's funny because bodybuilding kind of first got me interested in knowing about keto. Right. Yeah. So I, I understood it because a lot of bodybuilders, as you know, we cut down carbs as we get closer to the event to drop body fat. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and hold less water. So I already kind of 
like during my bodybuilding split, I think I was on like 30 or 40% carbs. And then as we got closer, like I pretty much had none, Mm -hmm. but I was, what I must say just to help people with health is I was doing it the wrong way where I was just on like protein and like no fat. So I was in, I was doing what's called gluconeogenesis all the time. So you can create glucose out of, and it's not, it's an expensive energy expenditure. Like you don't feel good when you're doing that. I call it brain dead central. Yeah, though you do feel brain dead because you have no, no your fat. body's trying so hard and it just yeah. has protein and no carbs and no fat. So it's yeah. like, if you're going to do keto, you need to have some fat. If you're going to do, you know, like higher carb, you need to be lower fat. Those need to be inversely right. related. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, so long story short, I did compete. I was like happy I did it just for the fact that I learned how disciplined I was. I learned how to follow structure. I, you know what I mean? Yeah. But long story short, definitely would do it different if I were to compete again, a hundred percent. I would not do an hour and a half of cardio per day. Like <laughs> no, zero. Uh, like just right now, just so you guys know, I don't do like my only cardio is walking. That's it. Yeah. That's all I do for oh, cardio. Um, as it. summer comes, I'm going to do sprinting like two days a week for like 20 minutes, maybe like 10 to 20 minutes. That's it. Yeah. But like literally to have lower body fat, you do not need to do endless amounts of cardio. You just need to get 10,000 steps a day. Yeah. Some days I get 20,000. If I really feel like going on a hike, you know, like that happens yeah. pretty often, but it's enjoyable now. Like me, I never liked cardio machines. I never did. Like I was on the Stairmaster every day for 45 minutes. I hated it. I thought it was miserable. Like, (laughs) so it's just like, there's a balance. Like now I I, I'm so happy where I'm at in my life. Cause I literally feel like I've never had this type of relationship with food, with health, with my rhythms, with my mental health. Like, it's like, you can, you can seriously have it all like, like legit, (laughs) like, you know, like you can be so happy. You can be in a good shape. You can be comfortable with your body. Clothes can fit. Well, you can sleep well, like all of it, like you can have all of it. (laughs) So don't like, think you have to sacrifice so much to, right. Yeah. When you you start tapping into how you're feeling as a result of the choices you're making, everything changes instead of this outside in thinking. So how was your gut health after competing, right? You lost your period, but what was your Oh yeah. it wasn't very good. Like it's it, uh-huh. like, everything was just, I didn't feel well. I rebounded with weight. You know what I mean? Like I had some like binging obviously after, cause I was so fucking right. deprived. Right. Um, so it kind of, like I said, so I found keto probably like right after competing. Um, so this was year, this was before keto was cool. This was like nine years ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like no yeah. one even had heard of keto. Maybe someone, I heard of a uh, Dr. Jacob Wilson, which is the muscle PhD online. So I'd heard a couple of his talks and Ryan Lowerly, and I was connected with them because I ran um, FitCon. So we brought them out for FitCon. And the first year we had FitCon, which I think was 2015. Yeah, 2015, we actually brought them out and they spoke on keto. And I remember I was curious because I was like, dude, what do I have to lose? I'm going to try it. I need to get my period back. I need to fix my hormones. I need to lose yeah. body fat that I put back on. It's, it made sense to me, right? I knew enough science that it made sense. Right. Um, so I just, and, and of course the first year it was not well accepted from the ba- you know, the basic community. Cause they're like, you need carbs to build muscle. And that's so right. wrong, blah, blah, blah. You know, but again, it just like, I was like, what do I have to lose? I'm just at least going to try it. Yeah. Um, so I did, I eliminated carbs. I was on protein and high fat and I started to feel much better, like much freaking better. Like I started to finally lose some body fat. Um, I still had inflammation that I feel like it took me probably a year or two to figure out, like maybe even a few years to figure out. Um, just a lot of inflammation. I mean, if you think about antibiotics and then serious dieting, like I had put my body through a ton of stress, you know, like a ton of stress. So, um, but I found keto, um, in, like I said, about that first year started dom- met Dominic D'Agostino, like met just all the community tied in with Jeff Bullock, all these people that do keto, the early adapters, I guess you would say, right. Cause they yeah. knew the science and it was like, And I knew it's so funny. Even then I was like, this is going to become mainstream. Like I'm calling it now. Like I know it's going to become mainstream, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's funny now because I think me and you have a similar, I do, I'm not full keto anymore, right? Like I I do have carbs, especially around my menstrual cycle that helped me get my menstrual cycle back. Um, I do have carbs on like leg days where I'm like really, really active. I do believe that carbs have a place, but, but if you are insulin resistant, I think you absolutely need to go keto for a while. I was very insulin resistant. I couldn't use carbs, right? So right. if you're insulin resistant and you don't fix that to get insulin sensitive again, yeah, carbs will make you fat. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like, you know what I'm saying? Again, it's not good or bad. It's just, where are you at? Are you exactly. also, we'll go into gut issues, but if you have SIBO and candida, carbs are not serving you at all. Like zero, yeah. like I will go into why, but yeah, let's you, do it. Yeah, let's do it. Why. So like, 
so just so you guys know, so let's go into SIBO and Candida first, and then I'll go into leaky gut. Okay. Um, it is common. Just so you guys know that people have all three, like it's very common because they kind of work on each other in a bad way. It's all about the environment with your gut. So one thing I want to really get through on this podcast, it's like hard in an hour, right? But your gut environment is what determines what your microbiome is. So if I have dysbiosis, which is the bad bacteria override the good bacteria, it's an ecosystem, just like a freaking ecosystem in nature. If I just in nature go in and throw in a bunch, like I'll give you an example. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Yellowstone, but they actually in Yellowstone decided to release a lot of wolves because there was too many deer, but they didn't know that they would be changing the whole ecosystem by throwing in an apex predator right? So you have to realize when you do things like antibiotics, you are changing the whole gut environment. And I can just tell you, cause now I train tons of clients on this online. And every single time that a person has gut issues, I go, when's the last time you took antibiotics? And they're like, it was two years ago. I took like three doses. And I said, when do your symptoms start right after that? So guys, this is common. Like, I really want you to know, start figuring out, did you take antibiotics or steroids um, I'm talking about like the, the steroids they give usually with like a autoimmune condition. They're called glucocorticoids. Um, it's the funny, I'll go into autoimmune after because it's really interesting. And I know a lot about it now that yeah, I didn't used to know, great. but, um, but SIBO, just so you guys know, so SIBO and candida SIBO is small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. What it is, is in your small intestine, let me just go through a quick little, you, you, you eat food, it goes through your mouth. You start producing enzymes is actually, as soon as you smell food, you start producing enzymes. I don't even have to touch it yet. I can smell it. And then as soon as I touch my food, which I do encourage people eating with their hands highly, um, cause you produce more enzymes, your body's so intelligent. It like knows what foods you're eating. And it's like produce proteins to digest protein, to digest amylase, to produce these carbohydrates. Like it's so intelligent. It's super freaking intelligent. Um, you eat food, it goes through your esophagus and then your whole digestive system is honestly just one giant tube separated by sphincters, a, a series of sphincters, right? So I have my first one, it's called the LES, it's at the bottom of the esophagus. A huge thing to know that if you do not have enough stomach acid, your LES will not close properly. And guess what that does? If it doesn't close and this one does actually not open, you actually get acid coming back up, which is acid reflux. So when they diagnose you with acid reflux and try to give you a PPI, which is a protein pump inhibitor that lowers stomach acid, they're actually causing more acid reflux. Just so or you know. antacid, Tums, all of this. Yes, did all the that? antacids. Like, did you hear that? Tell everyone. Literally, you know, yeah. Acid reflux look, means you have a too little stomach acid. problem and too little. Yes. And, the, and the, let me decrease it even more and more and more. <laughs> I know. And <sighs> you guys, just so you guys know, I'm very, very against PPIs. So this is like Nexium, Pro, uh, Prilosec. You can even get them at the grocery store now, which it like terrifies me. Um, I'm very against them because they actually, they have been tied to increase cancer risk like directly. And they have been tied directly to leaky gut too. They cause leaky gut. Wow. They also can um, affect your liver really badly. Like you don't want to decrease your stomach acid. You need it. Yeah. So just so you guys know, your stomach acid literally kills pathogens. It kills right. bacteria, viruses that are going to hurt you. So it's like a huge immune system thing. Like you will get sick more if you have low stomach acid. I promise. Like yeah. anyone that's on acid reflux medication, follow if they get sick more. I know lots of people. And I've told them. Go ahead. Yeah. Not to mention the break, they can't break down the food all the way, which I know nutrient absor absorption is going to go down. Yeah. And guys, if you can't break down your food properly, you're not going to break down protein to amino acids. And guess what your neurotransmitters are made out of amino acids. So I always see this connection where mental health suffers when people are on PPIs too, because they're not producing the right neurotransmitters and they're going to have nutrient deficiencies. Cause if you don't break down your food properly, I'm going to be low in zinc and vitamin B and you know, D3, like I'm going to be low in these vitamins because I'm not breaking down my food. So it's so bad anyway. So acid reflux is one that I really try to fix and I can fix it with clients like really quick, just so you know, like I've, I've done it. Like I've gotten people like to wean off their PPIs. I give them apple cider vinegar or betaine hydrochloride to increase stomach acid when they eat and they stop having acid reflux symptoms. It's like the easiest thing. Like I, I'm like, I don't even know why people like, Right. It's just funny. Once you know how to fix things, you're like, that was easy. Like, it's just like, but I mean, acid anyway. reflux sounds like it. I mean, apple cider vinegar sounds like it's probably about the same price as a PPI. So I don't know why they don't just use that. It's cheaper. It's $5. <laughs> I know. I'm kidding. Like a, I'm kidding. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. That's, that's, there's no, there's no money in it. Right. That's what right. I like. 
<laughs> so that's like the first problem I see happen is I always, I always check uh, stomach acid with clients. So it's like the first thing, right? Cause you got to start here. So then it goes into your stomach. It goes in your stomach should be very acidic, by the way, it's like 1.5 on the acidic scale. Right. So like when I hear about this alkaline water, I, I think it's a scam because I'm like, dude, your stomach needs to be acidic. I don't care what the f- goes in there. It's going to be acidic. It needs to be. So you drinking alkaline water, like it's not, it's not like, making you more alkaline. Just minerals. What is all I this? Know. Okay, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Again, well, it's like, you go into that. But anyway, it goes into your stomach. People don't know that it actually goes into your stomach from six for 60 to 90 minutes. It's in there. So 60 to 90 minutes, it's in there. It's churning everything. It's breaking down. It's like acidic. It's like literally a pull. And it's funny because a lot of people go, I have a stomach ache and they go like this. And I'm like, your stomach's like here. So like, that's your small intestine, honey. Like you're having small intestine issues, you know, um, goes into your stomach. And then from your stomach, it uh, exits called the pyloric sphincter. So it's another sphincter, right? That one stays closed. But guess what? If you don't have enough stomach acid, it opens. So this one doesn't close. This one opens. Do you see why that's a problem? Yes. Uh Undigested food starts to go into small intestine. So you got to realize then it goes into your small intestine after that. And you have 23 to 26 feet of small intestine, which is insane to me, like insane. So any, again, height will obviously vary it. So shorter people, probably 23 feet, taller people are probably 26 feet, right? You have, and that's just coiled up all right here. The small intestine is where most issues happen. I'm just going to say it again. The small intestine is where most issues are happening. Okay. There is sometimes that could happen in the large intestine and that's going to be more Crohn's and uh, IBD stuff. But if it's actually like anything, it's mostly small intestine that it's going to happen in. So the thing you have to realize about your small intestine is you are not supposed to have a lot of bacteria in there. You're not supposed to have a lot of bacteria. So if it's in there, you have to say, why is it in here? Like it shouldn't be right. So I think sometimes the way we approach SIBO is wrong. And I was wrong. Like I I'm always willing to accept when I'm wrong. Right. I thought, okay, you got to kill the SIBO and then like, you're good. Right. Like it's an invader, but like, I didn't realize you have to change the environment. Otherwise it will never go away. It never goes away. Like you can give someone drugs and you can give them herbs and you can change their diet. But like, if you don't change the environment, it will come back. There's, there's a reason it's there. Right. So just so you guys know, you have tons of microbiome in your large colon, which it goes to your small, small intestine is 23 to 26 feet. And then it goes to your large colon, which you have your ascending transverse and descending, and then it's out your anus. So I'm like, I love that. I say this sometimes people laugh. I'm like, dude, this is your body. Like you got to know, I talk about bowel movements like every day with my clients. Like it's not awkward anymore. I'm like, Like, what does it look like? How big is it? You know what I mean? Like, like, I want you to say it 10 times so you can get your like giggles out. (laughs) For real. Yeah. So it's like, just so you guys know. So like when you have a small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, so that means instead of them staying in your large colon, which they're supposed to be there, They're supposed to be in your large colon for a reason. I'll explain. But in your small intestine, they're not supposed to be there. Guess what happens in your small intestine? You absorb 90% of your food. 90% of your food is absorbed to your small intestine. So it goes through your intestine. You have these little villi that are like literally like this and they're absorbing food. They're looking for like, oh, protein, amino acids, triglycerides, like, you know, all the food, all the vitamin D, the vitamins, the minerals. Um, we'll go into leaky gut later, but just, you know, leaky gut is actually what happens in the small intestine. A lot of people think it's your stomach. It's not, it's your small intestine, right? You have an intestinal lining. It's actually being called intestinal permeability. Now a lot I've noticed like Dr. Dr. Rhonda Patrick just released something with intestinal permeability issues. And it's becoming a lot more mainstream, which I'm super happy about. I think that word jives better with Western medicine. I do too. (laughs) I do too. Leaky gut people are like, it doesn't even exist. You know, it does. Like there's so much research. Just so you guys know, there's actually been research on leaky gut all over the world for like 10 years in the Netherlands. I saw a study nine years ago about leaky gut. So, um, leaky gut, let's just go into it really quick. So what it is, is you have this lining in your intestines and it's really supposed to be tight. You have these tight junctions, right? And just so you guys know this lining, it's only one cell layer thick. And then you have some mucosal buildup, some like mucus that actually helps the mucus is good for you too. A lot of people like think mucus means bad in your intestinal lining. That mucus actually Um, it protects you against the outside world. So it's like part of your immune system. It makes sure that invaders don't come in, right? So this whole job of this leaky gut barrier, or sorry, this, this tight junction barrier is to keep food in to be absorbed and not come out. And then to keep invaders out of your small intestine. That's super important that that balance stays there, that boundary, which is funny because we'll get into boundaries in a second, because I do (laughs) think it's related. Um, But when you have these junctions that loosen, And it's caused mostly because of stress, by the way, leaky gut, a lot of times is actually leaked directly back to stress or glyphosate, which is roundup that's sprayed all over our crops, especially 
corn, soy, and grains. So that's why I, half the reason I avoid grains is glyphosate, right? Um, when you're exposed to glyphosate or stress, these junctions can become loose. And when they're loose, guess what happens? Food can actually go through. So food particles can go through undigested and then your immune system freaks out and goes, oh my gosh, attack it, attack it. It's a foreign right. invader. Yeah. So then guess what happens? An inflammatory response happens and you probably start getting food allergies. So yeah. all of a sudden you're like, man, I used to be able to all have it handle almonds and bananas, but now I like, I can't. Yeah. They like, you know, I get immune response. It's because you have leaky gut and you just have created a food allergy because your body remembers antibodies for those foods that it just had an immune response with, right? So it's like, if you get a, if you guys get a test lab, like Cyrex labs, it's like, uh, you know, food allergies and you test for like 20 foods, you have leaky gut, dude. Like you don't, yeah. I don't think you're allergic to 20 foods. You just have leaky gut. Yes. Like you can heal your leaky gut retest and have none of them. It's the coolest thing ever. Like the more I've learned about allergies, even seasonal allergies are actually related to your gut permeability for sure. Like I can, I've had clients that had runny nose, watery eyes. I put them on ion biome for a while, fix their leaky gut, nothing, no allergies anymore. And I love that you hit on the stress connection with it because a lot of clients come to me with these issues that you just described. And as they yeah. start doing inner work, healing work, you know, they're working with Catherine Dixon. We're doing a lot yeah. of mindset, releasing stress, creating boundaries. Like you talked about all of a sudden after years of all these interventions and all this like restrictive dieting, and I have these 40 foods I can't eat and all of that yeah. stuff, all of a sudden they're like, I had freaking corn tortilla chips at a Mexican restaurant and like all this and nothing happened. Right. Yes, so I'm like I know. Yeah, healing, healing, I know. healing. And that's why the Literally. mindset component is so important in health endeavors, yes. which I know you're big into too. You know, we both Huge. do plant medicines, meditation, Catherine Dixon, yeah. like all of these things, because when your body is actually in flow and in that rhythm, like you talked about, it yes. can heal itself. You can get yes. the out of the shoe. Emotions are so Huge. integral to this conversation. I cannot emphasize it enough. I have literally watched it over and over and I don't care. I don't need a freaking study. I'm like, well, that client and that client and that client and that client, as they reduce their stress and being in this emotional place of having to prove their value and can't say no to anybody and all that stuff, all of a sudden their freaking gut issues went away. So yep. Yep. <laughs> no, you're right. They're so, just so you guys know, you have a brain gut access. Like we're not even just making this shit up. Like you have a, a vagal right. nerve. It's your brain gut access. And it's constantly talking to each other. Like literally for every one signal that your brain sends your gut, your gut sends nine signals up to your brain. So I like, you know, it's funny. You'll hear the, the gut referred to as the second brain. Yeah. Sometimes I refer to it as the first brain. Cause right. I'm like, dude, the more I learn about the gut, it is like the center of the universe. Yeah. Like it is like Yes. Like it is like where you make neurotransmitters, your entire nervous system is in there, your gut instinct, everything is like in there, you know? So yeah, if you're having emotional trauma, you will usually start to have gut issues. And when I say this to people, I'm like, have you ever noticed when you get like really bad anxiety or your stomach hurts? And they're like, yeah, like all the time or like, yeah. Or I just like all it, it affects like bowel movements, right? Either they become constipated or diarrhea or like something like Emotions exactly. affect you. Like when you're and, nervous, what do you feel? Butterflies, you know, like. Right. And I always say uh, trauma, quote unquote, trauma is relative. Like one of, one of my clients, her, you know, issues were rooted in parents who had a lot of expectations on her constantly. And she just had this very like people pleasing personality. And so like, if you don't, if you think this stuff from childhood isn't affecting you and not being able to know what you want or worrying oh what other people think about you or chronically trying to prove your value through your body or your work life or how good of a parent you are, that stuff has to be addressed because to me, all of gut issues, they're just going to, uh, and I actually do want you to hit on changing the environment, but yes. that you're constantly recreating the environment for these issues to come back. Yes. If you're not managing stressful thoughts that go in your mind. And the reality is most people aren't even a freaking aware. They don't even, yeah. it's so normal to them to, they, they don't even realize what they're doing. Right. And it's not yeah. until they yeah. dive in that they're like, oh, wow. Like I actually do have a hard time saying no to people. Wow. I said no to that guy <laughs> and I got super anxious afterwards. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Actually, no, so it's true. Yeah. let's go into this, um, changing the environment. I love yeah. this. I love that, this. It's so mean, dope. How can someone yeah, change the environment? Dude, I love but, it because I, I think once I learned about this, I, something clicked huge for me that I was like, Oh my gosh, it's all about the environment. And guess yeah. what? So if anyone's read Bruce Lipton's book, Biology of Belief, he talks okay. about this. The cell yeah. is only as healthy as his environment, right? So they used to think the nucleus of the cell was the brain of the cell. And then they discovered that the cell membrane, which is like, you know, the membrane outside the cell is actually the brain. So I'm like, 
huh, if that's actually the brain and it's responding to its environment, because if you guys know about stem cells, you can put stem cells into any cells and they'll become that, right? So I can put a stem cell into a liver cell, it becomes liver. I've put a stem cell into ner a nerve cell, it becomes a neuron, right? Like it's the coolest thing because it changes based on its environment. So when I, when I started the, really the person that got me onto this was Dr. Michael Ruggio. He studies SIBO a lot. He's a very good doctor. In my opinion, he actually looks at everything. Like if I would have gone to someone like him, he would have diagnosed me so fast healed. And anyway. So he minded. I appreciate that. Yes. About. Yeah, yeah, he exactly. So the thing about your environment, let me give you a few things of what would actually cause an environment that would be SIBO leaky gut or candida. Okay. High inflammation. So having high inflammation affects your whole digestive tract in a lot of different ways. Um, so when we talk a lot about inflammation, like guys, we're not even talking about just fat loss. Yeah, that is a side effect. When you lose inflammation, you also lose fat, but it, it, is, it affects your whole digestive tract. So what happens is when you have high inflammation, it typically starts affecting what's called intestinal motility. So intestinal motility is how quick your intestines are actually moving okay. food through, right? So there's like a pair, you think about it. It's just a tube. It's a 23 foot tube like this, like a snake. So it has to like, it's called peristalsis, peristaltic action that like moves it through. So people, you will see this too. Usually people that are depressed or anxious have slow intestinal motility, or let me actually, let me rephrase it. I've found that usually depressed people have slow intestinal motility, anxious people actually might have too fast of intestinal motility. Nice. You don't want either. So listen how funny this is. I started tying connections and asking people that yeah, were my clients yeah, and yeah. I'll be anonymous about this. I'm not gonna share any names, but I, when I would have people that had more depression and felt like stuck, they were constipated. Interesting. Right. So yeah. slow intestinal motility, not having bowel movements every day, blah, you know, not sleeping yeah. well, like feeling depressed yeah. and blah. And then yeah. anxious. A lot of times if you're like really anxious, which I know they can come together, but when you're anxious, sometimes it can actually increase your intestinal motility. And it's because you are spending so much time in fight or flight mode really? with nervous right. system. Yes. Yeah. So if you spend too much time in fight or flight, sympathetic nervous system, your body actually tells you like evolutionary to cut off blood supply to your small intestine, because guess what? You don't need to digest food. You need, you need blood in your limbs. So you can freaking run away from the predator. Right. Right? right. So if I need to run away from a tiger, my body's not concerned about digesting food. So guess what it does? It cuts off blood supply to the small intestine and it actually increases activity in the large intestine. So you exit whatever you have. Wow. So yeah, that's that makes where, sense because people get yeah. really nervous and anxious and they feel like they have to poop. <laughs> yep. yeah. yeah. Or like wow. diarrhea. Wow. Like if you're getting, if you're right. having like really runny stools all the time, you're probably honestly and sympathetic too much. And you're actually not wow. absorbing your food. It's going through quick and it's like wow. release exit. She's like in danger. Right. So it's like, it wow. actually makes so much sense to me. And while we're talking about that real quick, I want people to know with Crohn's, that's usually what's happening too. You have an overactive large colon because of too much stress. So that's like, they call it spastic colon or Crohn's or diverticulitis, right? These are all kind of a spastic large colon and it's very linked to being in fight or flight too much. Wow. So usually it's low vagal nerve tone, which is the vagal nerve is what actually, your vagal nerve is what connects your brain and your gut. And it's what determines if you go to parasympathetic, which is rest and digest or sympathetic, which is fight or flight, right? So it's super, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, so on the inflammation thing, cause I know some people are probably wondering, they're like, first of all, how do they know if they're inflamed? And second yeah. of all, what are, you know, just general, uh, directions to steer someone into yeah. on combating that. So good, good question. So inflammation, the common symptoms is you'll have brain fog, a lot of brain fog. I almost every client that starts with me is like, it's just hard to focus. I'm fatigued chronically fatigued because you're not really using your food well because of so much inflammation, you're not absorbing it well. Um, so brain fog, chronic fatigue, not sleeping well is one too. Cause if you have digestive issues, it definitely will affect your sleep. Like staying asleep. Like when I had digestive issues, I used to have so many wake-ups, a lot of wake-ups when I started tracking. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that I've gotten better because I don't have a lot of wake-ups now. I just use the aura yeah. ring to track. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, you'll also, like I said, chronic fatigue, cause you're not really using your energy. Well, you're like metabolism is slow because you're not metabolizing food. Well, right. Yeah. You're not absorbing food well, and you're not like exiting it properly. So, uh, also just like I said, constipation or diarrhea, that's like a sign of inflammation too. Right. Um, and also you can like, feel it. you can feel it a lot, oh, you totally, know, like yeah. when I was in less optimal States, I would, I didn't know that I didn't have to wake up feeling like sore in my legs I and know. like, all oh, that's kind of feeling I'm like, Oh, I was just, yeah, how you feel on. Got in it. the morning. 
Yeah, like yeah. how you feel in the morning is a good indicator. I yeah. wake up feeling like freaking amazing, dude. Like yes. I feel like I'm like, oh, you know what I mean? I know. And I'm I heard like, you too. You're like, it's like euphoric. Cinderella with the birds being like, wake up, wake up. Like, I yeah. just shit you not. Like, when you get healthy enough yeah. and you go to bed early and you're in flow with your soul and you're eating well and you're happy, like, you can wake up feeling like exuberantly. Yes. Happy. It is yes. insane. Yes. yes. Okay. That's, no, that's a big thing. Like if you wake up and you're like, oh, like have a hard time waking up, don't feel rested. Like that's inflammation, right? Like that's totally inflammation. Also like definitely depression and anxiety, dude. When you have an inflamed gut, you have an inflamed brain too, because they are connected. So right. when you have inflammation, like it's going to affect mental health. And for me, this was super freeing for me because I thought I was just like depressed and anxious. Like I was like, oh, I guess it's like a mental illness that I have identification. <laughs> right? right. But it's like, no, your body's just like, I need help. Can you like, please lower this inflammation and like get things moving yeah. and like right it's like your body's just trying to talk to you like you don't have chronic depression anxiety like you can fix it you know like yeah. to me that was freeing because it's like you can just drop that identity and just realize yeah. that you have an issue that you need to fix that's it yes. you know thank you for that it's and like, so dropping inflammation favorite ways to help people drop inflammation yes so i i really like some certain herbs that i use curcumin is a huge one yeah. i love curcumin so curcumin oh. is like the the anti-inflammatory part of turmeric so you yeah. can take turmeric but i think curcumin is much better it's more yeah. absorbed um, uh, I like to get higher absorbed ones that are like maybe liposomal, you know, so curcumin I use also aloe vera extract is really good to calm the digestive tract. So you can do like the actual liquid and take like a tablespoon with your meals that really helps lower the inflammation. You mostly have to lower inflammation around meals because you're having a lot of inflammation when you eat. Right. So if I can lower inflammation while I'm eating also, um, licorice root, it's called DGL, like uh, licorice root is really good to calm the whole digestive tract, the small intestine. So like you got to start calming it. And then the number one thing is you got to fix your blood sugar. So there's been a lot of ties, especially Michael Ruggio, that's tied high blood sugar with SIBO and Candida. And there's a reason they eat it. They eat glucose, right? So you have, this is why I'm a big fan of keto for gut issues. If they are SIBO or Candida is because you're not using those carbs well. And guess what they're doing when you eat carbohydrates and you have SIBO or Candida, what happens is you, um, they eat like your meal and then they actually release gas, like a methogen gas, right? So the reason you're getting so bloated and gassy is because of the carbs they're eating and they're emitting a gas and then you get bloated and then you feel gassy and then you don't feel good, right? You feel like, oh, like just not good. It's because they just had like a feast on your food and you like didn't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they literally hijack you. It's really weird. But when you learn again, SIBO is small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So what happens is it's these bacteria that overgrow in your small intestine. Again, they're not supposed to be there and they're like, they're kind of parasitic, right? They're not like symbiotic with you, like normal gut bacteria. They actually want to eat your food. They want to replicate and they want to keep getting it. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're waiting for glucose. They're waiting for carbohydrates. So guess what happens? People that have SIBO or candida also have very intense cravings for carbs and sugar. They yeah. want soda. They want alcohol. They want candy. Like I had some clients and he, they're most active at night too, just so you know. So a lot of people get intense night cravings, like, like insatiable, like candy, soda, like they just eat all these, they binge eat on sugar. And then they're like, oh, I have a sugar addiction. I'm like, no, you have a candida overgrowth, you know, like, yeah. which is, it, it looks like a sugar addiction. So if you honestly feel like you have like a sugar addiction, I would definitely test for these because like, yeah. it's, it's one of the most common things of SIBO or candida. And just so you guys know, the difference is candida is a yeast overgrowth. So it's different than um, bacteria. It's a yeast. We yeah. all have levels of candida in our body, but when you have an overgrowth, it's typically because you have too much sugar and your body actually tries to overgrow candida to save you from getting diabetes. So really? you have to realize, yes, seriously. Yep. So it usually, it will, it almost is a protective adaptation to like, try to keep like, oh, there's so wow. much sugar. I got to proliferate candida so it can eat some Hell of the out. sugar. So she doesn't get insulin resistance Holy and like cow. start. Yeah. It's crazy. Like our bodies are so freaking smart. They're That's so smart. An interesting way of looking at it. I've never heard anybody put it that way of saving you from having diabetes to help quote unquote, digest all the extra sugar. Yeah. yeah. Eating. And I love, I love your mentality. Cause I know we're the same way. It's like, just listen, instead of being like, Oh, what's wrong with my body? My body's all messed up. And it's like, no, your body is constantly trying to tell you what it needs and what's going on. And if we can be respectful and kind and have a good relationship with it, like, I, I feel like my body is always like patting me on the shoulder. Yeah. Like, 
we know you don't know anything. So just sit down and listen to what we're telling you to do. <laughs> yeah. It's like cute. It's like, oh, it's cute. You're trying. Like, you know, yeah, no. Yeah, no, but it's like, say. <laughs> yeah. Like I love you brought that up though. Cause the relationship you can have with your body can be no. so freaking cool. Like no. I didn't, I feel like years ago, I didn't even know how to have a relationship with right. my body. Like right. legit. I was just like, oh my gosh, I need to get skinny. What yo-yo diet can right. I try? Or can I do right. this? And now it's like, I would never put my body through that because I love it. Like, I truly am like, thank you for like supporting me through all the craziness that I put you through for the last, yeah. like whatever years, like, exactly. Right. Like when you, yeah, it's just different when you really care and you're like, you look at symptoms. I always tell people look at symptoms as messengers, yes. like pain, inflammation symptoms are trying to tell you it's like, remember me and you talked about, it's like the car light, like your check engine yeah. light comes on yeah. in your car and you're like, yeah. let's just put a sticker on it and like, yeah. hope it keeps going. And like, you yeah. know what I mean? It's exactly. like, so dumb. Put a sticker on that. and, and the yeah. other thing is like, I like to start with people if they don't have this relationship with their body is to pretend that their body is a little kid when something's wrong. Right. Yes. So like, you know, I had a client recently, like she's had a lot of health issues and she's tired of being tired. Right. Which I totally yes. understand, but I had her do like, we kind of do a mini Catherine Dixon session, which is like self-inquiry. I had to do it on her tired body and pretend that her tired body is like a kid. So if you're tired all the time, or you have brain fog all the time, or you, you know, can't make your body composition changes, pretend that it's a little kid in front of you, ideally you, if you can get your imagination there and that they are like so sad because they want what you want and treat them the way that you treat your body with this dismissive punishing, you know, mentality. And it really changes the game. Okay. Yes. I want to get back to candida because okay. we had a candida um, doctor a few episodes before you, and I can't remember his statistic, but he was saying, I think he said like a third of Americans oh, they yeah. estimate yes. have candida. Well, so if, if you're hearing this and you're like, yeah, I have super strong sugar cravings. And I actually think that might be going on. Like, where does somebody start one to find out if they have it and two, like, you know, it's kind of like telling an obese person to just only eat salads. It's like, don't eat sugar. But it's like, yeah. Ah. yeah. Like what, like, do, you what eat? Recommendations yeah. do you have for people that, well, I thought it was that. interesting that you just said, so he said a third of the country has it. Guess what? Also a third of the country is pre-diabetic. Mm. Wow. See the connection, right? Oh, yeah. So cool. they are very much connected. Like that's the thing is I'm telling you blood sugar is a huge thing you have to get control over. So I've actually personally like a uh, NutriSense, which does like blood sugar monitors. They sent me one. You can just wear a continuous blood glucose monitor, like on your, um, on your tricep. Kara from NutriSense on the podcast. Kara called. Oh, you did. Okay. Awesome. So you guys yeah. know about this. I've had, I've encouraged some of my clients to get it because blood sugar will tell you a lot, right? Blood sugar will tell you a lot what your fasting blood sugar is. Um, what your fed blood sugar is, how long does it take it to get back to baseline? It's like, one of the coolest you, things I've ever done. And it's so it's cool. You should fast. know, you should know how food affects you. Like yeah. something that actually surprised me a lot. I'm, I was like strict keto for a long time, like absolutely yeah. no carbs. When I tried this, I wanted to try because I had been eating a little sweet potato, but not much. I was like, I want to try sweet potatoes. They didn't even raise my blood sugar, dude. Yeah. Like sweet potatoes, but rice did. So like, I realized, okay, like something with my genetics is like favoring yeah. the tuber vegetables, which right. I get. I love beets. I love sweet potatoes. And I feel like my body wanted those, but yeah. like some grains do spike my blood sugar. So it's yeah. like, I don't respond well to that. So learning like your baseline blood sugar and what you can handle and what you can't, right. it kind of changes the game. Cause you're like no longer maybe do I have to avoid carbs? I just have to figure out what carbs my body likes and what time right. of day. And do I need to walk after? And like, right. yeah, you and know, so down the road, 10 years from now, three years from now, two years from now, it could be different. Right. Yes. But yeah, it's really nice. I had a client that had been the typical, like programmed by the keto community that bananas were the worst things you could ever eat. And they spike your blood sugar like crazy. They're these genetically modified monsters that will kill you, you know? And she wore a, yeah, she wore a CGM from NutriSense and she's like, wow, I didn't even have a blood sugar rise at all from bananas, but I see blueberries, Right. So, and it's fascinating, so right? Interesting. It's cool fascinating. That you find that out about yourself. I found it fascinating to see how much my blood sugar went up from running to see how much oh, yeah. glycogen I was dumping out in my bloodstream. I was like, whoa, it's like high, yeah. it's like 140, yeah. you know, 150. Yeah, totally. And then even being nervous spiked it. And then, yeah, finding out your own response to foods. Like, I'm great with white rice. That's a problem for a lot of people. But I was like, yeah. that makes yeah. sense. I feel great. It doesn't seem to do much to me. So, yeah. Anyway, okay. so, so, blood, yeah so, blood sugar. And then also, so you got to realize with candida, now that I've just tied this connection for you guys of candida and diabetes, 
hello, there's a reason. So like I said, your body is actually trying to protect you. And so what happens is you have too much blood sugar for too long. You become insulin resistant, right? We know that. But what happens is you start to an overgrowth of candida. So everyone has candida, guys. It's not bad in small amounts at all. It's an overgrowth that's bad. So when you create an environment of two things, high blood sugar and high inflammation, it is breeding grounds for candida, right? And could be for SIBO too. Yeah. Um, candida, the thing about it is I, I personally believe if you want to get rid of, rid of candida and SIBO, you absolutely have to lower carbs for a long time in order to get insulin sensitive. Again, you can easily see if you're insulin sensitive with blood sugar, right? So if right. I wake up and I have a hundred, 140 blood sugar, I know mm -hmm. I'm insulin resistant, dude. Like that's not a normal fasting blood sugar. No. If I eat and it goes to 200, that's not a normal blood sugar. I know I'm insulin right. resistant, right? So using these technologies that we have now that I didn't used to have have like continuous blood sugar monitors, like super helpful. Do I need to do, I think you need to wear them for six months. No, I think you could wear them for a month, you know, like, but you have to fix your blood sugar issue. The thing about candida that's interesting too, is they're kind of resilient. Like they're kind of like a little tough, you know, because they they're like adaptable. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get rid of them, like, yeah, you really have to get rid of I recommend people don't even eat fruit during the time of a candida yeah. cleanse, like at all, no, like totally. no, just sense. like fully. I honestly have seen really good results in 90 days with a lot of clients. They've rid all carbs for 90 days ago, full keto for 90 days. I have some of them go full carnivore for like yeah. 60 to totally. 90 days because it's so bad. I had one guy that right. came to me, such bad candida, just so you guys know with candida, you'll start to have skin stuff happen too when it's bad. So what happens is you'll get like little red bumps on your arms, you get acne, people get acne, they get all of a sudden like little pimples on their back and like all over their body. And then they're like, what's going on? What happens is your body's trying to detox through your skin. It's trying to push out candida through your skin. Mm -hmm. So it's like trying to sweat it out, but it's creating a lot of like blemishes. And um, some people even have rashes, right? Uh, yeah. Dandruff, if you have dandruff, that's a sign of overgrowth of candida. If you have white elbows, have you guys ever seen where they have white elbows yeah. like this? That's a sign of candida. Um, they're very clear indicator signs. Like when I've gotten clients with candida, they usually have all of them. They get, um, also it's a fungal overgrowth. So if you're getting like athlete's foot and like ringworm, like often yeast infections, often it's a yeast overgrowth. You're getting all these symptoms that you have a candida overgrowth. Some people live with candida overgrowth their whole lives and don't even know. And they're just like a little depressed and anxious and brain fog and tired. And they don't know that they've had candida for like 10 years on overgrowth. Yeah. And then what happens is they usually are pre-diabetic. And then I just want to say most, what this is crazy. I just figured this out. A lot of cancers, the precursor is they'll have a candida overgrowth before they develop cancer. Because what does cancer feed off of? Glucose. Wow. That's right? So they're all connected. It's this glue. It's just, you got to look at our food guys. Like even yeah. if I wasn't a keto advocate, look at our food at the grocery store. Right. The whole middle section is yeah. sugar. The Don't whole middle started. section is sugar. Like you need to stick to the outside perimeters to actually get food now because you go inside. Luckily, I, I should say there's a few good brands that are like creating like healthier packaged yeah. foods, you know, but right. for the most part, it's sugar. Like you need to yeah. be aware of looking at the back of ingredients, look at, looking at carbohydrate content and looking at sugar. Like they'll add it to peanut butter. They'll add it to like fruit juices. Oh my gosh. Like stop drinking those. That's like, like if you're going to have fruit, eat real fruit that has fiber that slows down the blood sugar. Don't just like eat fruit right. juice. You know what I mean? Like, right. so you got to realize this high, high sugar environment creates candida. And if you want to get rid of it, you have to get rid of sugar for a while, become insulin sensitive. And then there's certain herbs that can help with candida. But one thing that's kind of hard is you, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's like an outside shell of candida. That's like a, a protein shell. Like they develop it to be resilient. So a lot of times you actually have to take an enzyme blend to break out, break that shell and then kill the candida with certain uh, herbs, right? So like there's different herbs like black walnut and um, different Chinese herb blends. So I personally use Nutridyne for a lot of this stuff. They have like a, they have like what's called a dynamic intestinal cleanse that has a lot of really good stuff that targets like candida and dysbiosis. Um, but but a big look at that one. Sorry, I guys. know. Sorry, <laughs> you, you have to become like me. a client. Yeah. So work with me or work with Tara because yeah, it's not the general public. I mean, yeah. eventually I might actually try to be formulating my own like candida supplements yeah, at this totally. point because I'm like, I would like them to be accessible to everyone. But <laughs> the thing you have to realize is like, yeah, you can live with it, but it's not fun. Like you're just going to keep having issues. Like I said, my guy that came to me with severe candida and just, so you know, let's talk really quick about how do you know you have candida? There's two ways. One is you can just identify with symptoms. If you have 
all the symptoms I've just listed, very likely you have candida. It's over a third of the country has it, <laughs> you know? And then also there is a test you can take. It's a blood test and it's called candida albicans antibody test. You can literally take it. If you have an overgrowth, you'll show high antibodies for candida because your body has created defense against this overgrowth that's trying to fight, right? So um, the guy that came to me, he had already taken a blood test and he'd already shown high candida and they gave him a drug, <laughs> surprise, you know, called Diflucan that can kill candida. But the problem is it, it, it tries to kill it and then you get off of it and it, the candida comes right back because you haven't changed the environment. Yeah. So then usually when it comes back, it comes back with a vengeance. And it's like bad. Like he had it real bad. He started having I mean, full body acne, like mucus, like, I mean, just dandruff, athlete's foot, like all candida stuff. And he just felt terrible, horrible brain fog. Couldn't even work. Literally couldn't work. After 90 days, he was like really disciplined. Like, I love this client because he's like, I'm all in Jenny. Like you tell me what to do. I'm in, like, I'll do it, you know? And because he's young, he was like 28 and he like had no life. Like, this is ridiculous, yeah. right? 28 years old, a male that's like in his prime, you know? Right. So also, just so you guys know, it's going to usually lower your sex drive a lot. He had like, you know what I mean? Like no sex drive because it's affecting all your hormones, you know, totally. and you feel like shit. Like, totally. so they put him on Diflucan. Like I said, it came back worse. Um, once we got on him on a protocol, which I put him on full carnivore because it was so bad. Right. So I put him on a full carnivore. Um, like if you guys know me and follow me, I am a fan of carnivore, not for yeah. long-term, but for short-term, it's like an elimination diet. Like totally. you I eliminate use- all the things that are yeah. Yeah. Hurting you if you have gut issues. Right. So I don't think long-term you should be on it for like five years or anything, but if you're using it for 90 days as a tool, I think it's amazing. Like, like such a good tool. Yeah. Right. So he went on to that. He did follow the candida protocol on my, on my, I do a certain protocol with people if they want to work with me, but I do, it is quite a bit of supplements for 90 days, but it works so well after 90 days, he had like no brain fog anymore. His yeah. bowel movements, his skin cleared up. He also had hemorrhoids. Sometimes hemorrhoids can happen when you have candida and, uh, and also, and, uh, SIBO because you're straining a lot to like have bowel movements. So it starts to create hemorrhoids. So that's another sign, another symptom. So it's like, if you have all these symptoms, like, I don't think you need to go take a blood test. But the reason I say that is because I'm not a drug dealer. I'm giving you herbs. Like these herbs are not going to hurt you. Even if you didn't have a candida overgrowth, I'm targeting to give you a better gut bacteria balance. That's all we're doing. Like we're just getting rid of inflammation and we're increasing intestinal motility and we're trying to get the good guys to have a chance. That's it. You know? Yeah. And I have to do like a little backup for keto, because I know that if you're in that candida sugar craving thing and you hear somebody say you're going to go keto and not any eat any carbs or sugar, that can sound scary, but actually all I'm sure it's been the same for you because the you're starving out those, that yeast or whatever yes. it is. And, and on top of it, your blood sugar, it's regulated and you get these um, anti-inflammatory ketones circling through your system. I can't tell you how many they're like, they don't even think they're like, this cannot be me, dude. I, I know believe that I'm not having like food cravings and sugar cravings. Like what? So yeah. just saying like, you will be surprised. Even my client, I had a client with SIBO that was doing carnivore and she the same thing, you know, super big cravings. She's like, I cannot believe I can do this. Like it's actually really well. She had like almost a complete personality change. I mean, yeah. it was like I got to meet yeah. the real her without all of this inflammation and poor ability to make her neurotransmitters. Like it was amazing to watch. You know? so, so it does, it does change people's personalities. I even like, yeah. that's the thing guys, if you have a, this, these issues, like I promise it's affecting your mental health more than, you know, because all of a sudden you thought you were like an anxious person that was scared and like not social they've done studies. And when you change the gut microbiome, it actually does change your personality. They literally did a study like this where they did a fecal transplant, right? Yeah. So this yeah. was with uh, mice. And then I think they did it in humans too, but I'm not positive. So don't quote me on that. But what they did is they did a fecal transplant. They t- transplanted uh, extroverted mice, which I'm like, how do you know if a mice, but they're like really social. Like there's ways to tell if there's an extroverted mice uh-huh. versus introverted. And they actually transferred bacteria from the extroverted to the introverted mice and then vice versa, the introverted mice to the, the extroverted. And they realized that, and not only did it make the introverted mice more social and extroverted, but they realized that they had a wider diversity of microbiome. So if you're an extroverted, um, they've realized personality traits that people usually that are extroverted have a diverse microbiome and they have more what's called acromancia. There's a, there's a, a whole field of bacteria called acromancia and they had wider diverse, diversity of acromancia when they were more extroverted. So it's like, you guys, it does change your personality. You got to realize this. 
Okay. And the reason I'm looking down, I'm not trying to be horrible. I wanted to pull up this picture. So for anybody looking on YouTube, do you know, Ryan Rose Evans, have I showed you his account? Uh He came on the podcast and talked about his fecal transplant and that completely cure. And yes, guys, we're talking about like you take someone else's feces and you inject them into someone else, like an enema. Yep. Yep. And it's freaking incredible. Amazing. What happened. Yes. Can you see this, Jenny? Can you see him? Oh my before? gosh. Yeah. And yeah. after he had like a complete life change, he was like, like a British gangster thug, super into bodybuilding, like addictions, like in and out of jail. I think he said even like all this stuff had that completely like healed him. He like went into a totally different life trajectory, right? Yes. So that doesn't say much about like the importance of your bacteria balance and your gut all the way through. I don't know what does. I mean, that's how yeah. much it's impacting your life on the daily. Yes. It's yes. huge. It's huge. Like, that's what I'm saying, guys. Like, if you think, oh, I just want to have better digestion. It goes so much further than that. It's like, do you want to feel safer? Do you want to have, be more yeah. social? Do you want to be like more adventurous? Like, I really believe it's that detrimental. Like if you, they've done so many studies and I'm just telling you from right now, you're going to see so many studies coming out on microbiome oh, in the next few years. Like oh, me and Tara are in the community. We know what's going to happen. Yeah. Like I am already so connected with people that are coming out with this amazing research about the microbiome and it affects everything, like everything. It's how we interact with the world. Like if we understand that our microbiome, it's this little gut, it's not even gut bacteria. When I say microbiome, you have microbiome on your skin, in your mouth, every orifice that you, out, that you interact with the outside world, you have yeah. a huge, so just so you guys know, the most dense microbiome you have is in your large colon. And then second most dense is your mouth. You yeah. have tons of microbiome in your mouth. So if you're using mouthwash, like, oh, oh my God, please, please don't no. like stop with the mouthwash. You don't want to kill. You have bacteria here for a reason. Right. They're literally trying to protect you. They're part of your immune system, trying to protect you from viruses that are out everywhere and sorry to, but real quick on viruses like we're exposed to them all the time guys like i don't know what we've been told this last few years but you're exposed to viruses all the time like all the time all the, every second like all the right time. now yes <laughs> like right now you've been exposed to them but you have an amazing immune system you have an adaptive immune system an innate immune system that's all there to pick up on these things and create like attack plans for them you have the most amazing immune system so like don't hurt it. Like stop hurting it. Please stop right. using antibacterial stuff. Like, please like stop using antibacterial mouthwash. Like stop it. Like you're yeah. killing what's trying to help you. Like you're killing them. And like, I know it sounds weird because people are like, you're so passionate about microbiome. And I'm like, you can't even see them. I'm like, I know, but like, they're all there. I know they're there yeah. and I know how I can help them. And let's just go into that for like five minutes yeah. because microbiome, if you guys haven't read the, the book, um, I'm trying to grab it, but it's called the good gut by Justin Sonnenberg. It's amazing. He's a microbiologist. Him and his wife both have been studying microbiome for 20 years. Like they're obsessed. I'm obsessed too. So I'm like, I'm going to be there in 20 years. Don't worry. Yeah. But like, <laughs> but like, seriously, like I, I am obsessed with microbiology now. Like I have a textbook. I've been like flying through it. Like I'm obsessed, but like <laughs> the things you have to realize is you have microbiome on your skin. So I know this is going to sound weird, but like, be careful of the soap you're using. Like, don't yeah. like, I personally, I'm like very, I don't even like, I, I don't even like if someone has antibacterial stuff, I don't ever use it. I like bring oh, my own soap yeah. places, like Meyer soap or seventh generation ones that are just purely like without antibacterial stuff. Yeah, just um, yeah. And just be careful. All beauty products that you're using that are killing microbiome, hair products, beauty products, perfume, they're all endocrine disruptors. And I got to tell you something that I haven't told you yet that I'm like, I just found out. But I, I, I can't remember who was saying it. I think it might have been Justin Sonnenberger. No, it was uh, Andrew Huberman, Dr. Andrew Huberman. He said, your skin, your skin is an endocrine making, uh, endocrine making organ. Your skin wow. literally makes hormones. Like we wow. now it's like, I've known this, but I didn't really think about it. Like your skin is a yeah, hormone making organ. Yeah, I just it never makes, thought of it that way. Why do you get oxytocin when you touch another person? Right. Like, hello. You know what I mean? So like, why are, why are we so sensitive to light? Like, why do we, how do we use photons? Like, you know what I mean? Right. So it's your skin. That, yeah. yeah. Like, why do you produce more serotonin when you're in sunlight? It's because it's a skin right. produce. It's an endocrine, you know, like organ that's making Love literally it. hormones. So when you're using these harsh chemicals on your skin and chemical peels and all this stuff, like you're hurting your microbiome, you're a big part of your microbiome is your skin microbiome. And they've done research. Justin Sonnenberg has done a lot of research in his lab. He has a lab. And he's like, if you want a more diverse microbiome, be around animals, mm -hmm. like literally have a pet, be around farm animals. People that grow up on a farm are like their likelihood of having allergies is like 80% less, 80%. Mm -hmm. Like, holy shit. 
right? So being around animals, being around, being dirty, like right. people laugh at me. I love getting dirty. I go camping. Oh, and I don't want to shower, girl. dude. Oh, I yeah. know. <laughs> I, I, in fact, I just went to Moab just barely. And I, my friends were laughing at me because I was laying in the dirt. They were like, oh, yeah. should you put a towel out? I'm laying in the sand. I do the same like, thing, but I know. immersed, like the sand on me. Like I yeah. love nature. I love it. Like I'm super connected yeah. to I it, right? I want all of that. I want, I want it, all, all of, it. of it. And so I love getting in the mud. I just went to this hot springs that we're going to go to. And there was like mud at the bottom. I was putting it on my skin. Like oh. I love it. It's so good for you. Minerals and microbiome. So one thing you have to realize is you want a diverse microbiome and people a lot of times just think, yeah. oh, I, it's what I eat. It's not just what you eat. It's what you're around. Yeah. They've actually shown studies that if you're, if you're more social, you're around more people. So your microbiome diversity is higher. And if your microbiome diversity is higher, you're more social. Like there's a connection there, right? Like oh. this is why we want to be around each other. And this, in my opinion, is why 2020 was so detrimental because guess what? We were all doing Zoom. We weren't in person. You right. can't share a microbiome over digital. You can't. No. So like when we're like, I know it sounds weird because they taught us to like be scared of each other and six feet away and all this crap, but it's like, no, we need to be by each other, breathing on each other, touching each other. Like I, I've become so much less of like a germ freak, I'd say you'd say, because I'm like, oh, I need it. Like if someone's sick, I don't even care anymore. I'm like, cool. My yeah, immune system's yeah. great. You can, you can be around me. I don't and if care. I get sick from it, I'll just build my immune system more. Exactly. But more to me than me being terrified of you and this. That's what I'm saying. Thing. Like yeah. we need like that, the like the more I learn about microbiome, it's like, you actually learn about life, right? Because like the diversity needs to be there. Um, there's so many things also, just so you guys know, as far as if you were a C-section baby versus a natural birth baby, you will have a less diverse microbiome. There's ways to build it, but you have to realize that if you were a C-section baby, your chances of allergies go up, your chances of autoimmune go up. Um, autoimmune is actually very tied to microbiome too and to the gut. And I'll kind of, yeah. if, if we have time, get I can get that into that. Quick, that's a yeah. huge thing. And we didn't yeah. get there. Yeah. 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 Let's go there. And I'm guys, I'm sorry. I know we're talk, like covering so many subjects, but we can definitely go into I'm sure they're later. Enjoying. I am, but like, <laughs> I know. Okay. So autoimmune, I do want to go into that. Cause I've been really curious about it the last couple of years. And honestly, yeah. it wasn't something I knew a ton about. So I started kind of diving into it and I wouldn't say I'm an expert by any means, right. but I do know quite a bit. Um, so one thing you got to realize about autoimmune, I don't think anybody, by the way, <laughs> I yeah, mean, I'm like, I think we're so all, been, kind of like, I mean, they're right? experts, right. But it's like, there's <laughs> always more to learn. I'm quote unquote, a training expert, but it's like, no, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> so the, I think it's interesting. You guys have probably noticed autoimmune has skyrocketed over the last few years. Um, there's a reason for that. I'll go into it. So they're very connected to your microbiome. It's very connected. He goes into it in the good gut book quite a bit too. So you can read that if you want, or listen to the episode of uh, Andrew Huberman and Justin Sonnenberg. He was also on his podcast. How it's are like you a spelling his last name? Uh, it's like S-O-N-N. Shoot, I wish I had the book out like here, but e um, S-O-N-N-E-B-E-R-G, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So S-O-N-N-E, yeah, Sonnenberg. Okay. Um, so I was like just trying to look because I have my bookshelf here, but I'm like, I think it's somewhere else. But anyway, um, so- when you have a less, when you don't like really nourish your microbiome, which let me tell you what your microbiome need. Okay. They need sunlight. <laughs> they need fresh air. They need water. Um, they need to not like to just be left alone, like stop with the antibacterial, everything and like hyper, like cleaners and stuff like that. Like we, we want to live with microbiome. We are already right. Mm -hmm. So we want to develop like a good relationship with them, not a fearful relationship with them. We have a good immune system and they're there to help us. But this is the thing that's interesting. Our microbiome, they formed a relationship with us for a reason. We are their host, right? We yeah. provide them shelter and food, right? So why would they want to go anywhere else? And they would want our host to survive. So that's right. one thing you got to realize, right? When you start to have dysbiosis, it's usually because there's a lot of things off in your life, right? That are creating a bad environment for them to be in. So just think about that. Like, okay, how is my environment? Like, is my, yeah. Like, do I, um, do I shower every single day with antibacterial wash? Like, can you just do a quick body shower then? And like, I don't wash my hair every day. You know what I mean? Like I let the oils in it naturally sit there. I only wash it like once a week. Um, I personally don't even body shower every day. I'll like do a quick, like, I'll make sure like my armpits. So I smell good. But you right. know, the weird thing is when you, when you're like a detox person, you don't smell bad. Have yeah. you noticed that? No. Like I, I, I don't get BO anymore. Ever since I started using like natural deodorant and detoxing regularly, like I don't smell bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that sounds weird. I'm not saying like, but I'm serious. Like I used to, I used to have bad BO, but like when you start to detox all the shit, you don't smell as bad. Right. right. Um, 
So be careful be, about, I would just say a huge part of being a good host. <laughs> yeah. Be a good host, you know, like, for, like make sure you have a good them. time, you know? Yeah. Um, so really quick, <laughs> have, a good time. have a good time. <laughs> so what they want is they need, like I said, they need a good environment and then they also need diversity and they want plant diversity. So unless you have SIBO or candida, having fiber is amazing for your gut bacteria. That's what they eat. They right. literally eat prebiotic fire. We don't digest it. They do. That's what they eat. They have like a feast when we eat yep. fiber and then they like, they have their bride products and then they're happy and they're fed. If I'm just going to say really quick, if you have SIBO, don't do fiber, don't please do don't. It makes it way worse. You'll get bloated. So don't, you, if you already SIBO, know that you already don't know. do it. <laughs> and also don't do fermented food. If you have SIBO either fermented food can actually make it really bad too. It's more bacteria. So those are the only two. If you don't have those two, you want a wide diversity of fiber. So just so you guys know the Hadza tribe in Af South Africa, they, an average of 150 grams of fiber per day. Wow. 150 you know, grams. I'm like the fiber queen, which makes me sound like I'm like some 75 year old, <laughs> but like a really, truly, like I went through, you know, I went through some really stressful life transitions and I, I kind of marvel at it. I'm like, I cannot believe that I didn't get gut issues going through. All I know like me too. Yeah. Emotional and life stress. And I really think it was because I stayed on top of the basics. I really actually think it's because I eat a wide variety of foods, including a lot of fiber. Like I just love them. I really, yes. I've learned to really enjoy those kind of foods. I exercise regularly. You know what I mean? And I think the yes. mobility and the yes. fiber, just keeping things moving or what saved my gut during that time. Yes. Like fiber totally. Thing. Yeah. So fiber, so a wide variety of fiber. So he says, and Justin Sonnenberg in his book says the Hadza tribe gets an average of 150 grams a day. Of course, their bodies have adapted to that. Right. I would not <laughs> recommend that yeah. for people. You're going to be so <laughs> bloated. Um, but he did say that he would recommend the average that women shoot for is 36 grams per day, okay. which is a little higher than a lot of people will say. So yeah. 36 grams a day. I know I get that dude. I, you I know, know I, do. I like, I do too. I like love, I love fibrous foods. Right. <laughs> yeah. But that's one thing you got to realize is you have to support, you have to have prebiotic fiber, which is right. this, that's what they eat. Right. So unless you have SIBO or candida, you need to have a high fiber diet and I'd recommend people gradually do it. Yeah. So if you, I, say. <laughs> let's say he said, he said the average in America. Okay. I just want you guys to, I want you to guess. So how much do you think the average person in America is eating grams of fiber per day? Oh, it's low. I'll tell you that. It's really 10. low. Is it even 10? Six. It's six oh grams. my gosh. No wonder we six. have some like mental health. Issues. We have, do you want to know why too? People are like, Oh, I eat bread. It has no fiber in it. And it's all been removed. I just went off. I just went Dude. off on a live about this last night. I'm like, you want to yeah. know why you're overeating and gaining weight? A big reason is because you don't have enough protein and fiber. If all yes. I eat was fat and carbs, like these, like, you know, crispy yeah. And yeah. Chip, you're never going to get full off of that. Never. You oh. could eat all, overeat all the time. <laughs> Yeah. If you try to eat, if I like, I would challenge someone, if you can get to hundred grams of fiber per day, like good luck, even trying to eat all that food. Like that's a lot, exactly. you know what I mean? So that's the reason you feel full fiber makes you feel full. Yeah. So if the average American is getting six grams of fiber and we need 38 grams as a female, like we have a long way to go. Like that's at least 30 grams, 30 to 32 grams. Right. So it's like, start Not figuring the, out right? like when they firm, ferment the short chain fatty acids. So I keep trying to help people yes. understand. I'm like, you need that for your mental health. You guys. Yes. Yes. Like, it's, it's huge. Really it's super anti-inflammatory too. Right. We and talk like, about inflammation. When you feed your good bacteria fiber, they create anti-inflammatory, like, as, right. you know, short chain fatty acids. So it's like, right. and I'm like, you don't have to like, we're, we're in this, like, if it fits your macros, I get it. Like, but like, it's this like, Oh, I can have Skittles. Cause I have that many I know. left or There's whatever. Fiber, like, though. like you don't have to like micromanage your health journey that much. You really don't. If you will just be proactive, yes, so eating yes. more wide variety of vegetables, learning how to make them taste good, cook them up in some butter or some yes. like bacon or whatever. Enjoy Brussels sprouts cooked in bacon fat. It's oh my gosh, dude. With a bunch of salt on it. Like, are you serious? I, can't you can't eat that? I mean, if yeah. you don't eat that, but otherwise yeah. it's like, and then like, Anyway, just increasing that alone, if you will just focus on fiber at proactively adding these things in your life, yes. you will naturally start changing your body composition, feeling better. I know better energy levels. you're so it's right. It's simple. So it's psycho. literally like increase fiber and protein and you will lose weight, dude. Like it's so simple. <laughs> You'll eat less hard. naturally without like yes. weighing on a food scale. Like I don't yes. fucking weigh on a food scale anymore ever. You know just what I mean? Add like, it in. And how yeah. refreshing is that mentality and diet culture? I need so more protein. I need more fiber. So anyway, yes. that's little, no, I love it. So okay. five, yeah. So fiber is huge. Like I said, if you don't have seabird candida, you need to have a diversity of, of fiber. And then I know just cause we're probably short on time. Let me get more into autoimmune. 
So yeah. that just understand that the 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 immune system, the microbiome are highly connected, highly. So I, the microbiologist that I met, I'm actually doing an Instagram live with him tomorrow, Kieran Christian, that we met. Oh, you are. Um, okay. Yes. He's on this podcast too, you guys. Oh, he has. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh he's God. going to. So, he's going to. Oh, he's going to. Yeah. Okay. I'll he's brilliant, dude. So. <laughs> The thing I love about him is he was saying like, the thing about you don't realize is your immune system and your microbiome are so interconnected. He's like, honestly, your immune system cells are kind of lazy unless your microbiome were there. They'll notice something. He's like, this is how it is. They'll notice something and they're like, that doesn't look right. And then your microbiome is the one that's like, let's go get it. Like, let's go like attack. Right. So like Mm -hmm. without your microbiome, you just have to realize your immune system is compromised. It's very compromised. They're, they work together. They want to be, your microbiome wants you to stay alive. So it can have a host dude. Like, so that's Mm -hmm. the reason it works with your immune system. Like just think about it's common sense, you know? Um, so the thing about autoimmune is usually your microbiome is compromised and then usually leaky gut is there. So there's been a lot of studies done with leaky gut and immune system. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with LPS, it stands for lipopolysaccharide, but it, when you have leaky gut, you'll have high amounts of lipopolysaccharides. And they did a study in the Netherlands nine years ago, and they were able to predict who had depression and anxiety and how severe it was based on the amount of LPS that they released. Yeah. So how leaky was your gut is how depressed you would be. And they were accurate. They didn't even like ask the people like, are you depressed or anxious? They literally just looked at their LPS levels and were like, you must be depressed and anxious because your LPS is like off the charts. That's awesome. Yeah. I remember Isn't that crazy like, on that at a biohacking conference. I was like, Whoa. yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, okay. So that's, so, so, I mean, we, a lot of people know they hear immune health is the center of like the gut is the center of your immune health, but that's helping. I love that. Like kind of visual that you provided of, they're like, let's go get it. Yeah, right? You're doing the actual it. Yeah. Work, right. So you need yeah. healthy workers that aren't yes. bogged down with all these other, you know, <laughs> candida, other, yes. and all, you know, and ha- having a wide variety of workers too. Yes. For different yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. so diversity, I do want to get in the last part of autoimmune that I just learned. This is where I've gone on this like other tangent, you know me, I get obsessed. I'm so weird, but yes. I find something and then I'm like, ah, and I like read and like, like yes. spastically, like, so I just finished this huge book that I'd recommend to everyone. The only thing is, okay, maybe not everyone. Cause it is kind of scientific. So you kind of have to understand understand scientific big words to read it. <laughs> I will say yeah, that you would love it. Okay. Sick. But uh-huh. yeah, so maybe it, it, it's not a good book to start with, but if you've been on this journey for a while and you really yeah. understand a lot of these medical terms, you would love it. So it's called, um, why zebras don't get ulcers. And it's, it's all about the stress response and it's love Robert, it. Robert Saplowski. So it's a weird last yeah. name, but Saplowski it's S A P L O S K Y. We can put it in the notes, but he is a neuroscientist. I love neuroscientists, by the way, guys, if, it, yes. if you're a neuroscientist or a microbiologist, like I'm obsessed with you. So that's like, I'm obsessed, you know, <laughs> totally. So he's a neuroscientist. He, I, I finished his, like, it was like a 450 page book with like small print. And I finished it in like two weeks. Like I'm like that I'm weird like that, yeah. but I was like, holy shit. Like, how did I not know this information? You know? <laughs> so yeah. he goes into it. And he talks a lot about what's called glucocorticoids. So glucocorticoids are your stress response, right? It's all the stress hormones that we release when we're in fight or flight. So he goes in depth into mm-hmm. the book about what fight or flight really is. Like what is everything happening in the body? And I've studied this stuff already for a long time. And I was like learning new things, which for me is like rare. <laughs> like, you know, that's what's so cool. It's like, I, I know a lot about the nervous system a lot, but yeah. like I was still learning stuff. So what happens is, This is the most fascinating thing. This is why I was like, I had this crazy aha moment. So when you produce excess glucocorticoids, which again, these are like adrenaline, norepinephrine, cortisol, like the stress hormones, right? What happens is it does hurt. It actually lowers your immune system. Like it's well, well documented that they lower your immune system. Let me tie something in that's really interesting. With autoimmune people, they have excess high levels of glucocorticoids. But if any of you guys know, what do we give people with autoimmune? The Immuno, immunosuppressants. Right. And guess what we give them to lower their immune system? The, Glucocorticoids. Right. So what is causing their autoimmune? We give them to cure it. Like, so they have autoimmune because they have excess glucocorticoids. And then we're giving them glucocorticoids to lower their, suppress their immune system because their immune system is attacking itself. Right, right, But right. like, see the problem with this? Like, yeah, it goes it's into- like, why are these elevated in the first place? 
Yes. Right. Like, and why aren't we that. fixing that? The right. reason that their immune system, he gives a good example. He's like, think about it. If your immune system is overactivated, right? So you have excess glucocorticoids and it's like in high alert because it's in fight or flight all the time. And it's right. probably in fight or flight because you have unheld emotional issues and you have inflammation and you have a wrong environment, right? So, or you have toxic relationships. There's so many reasons they could be elevated, right? Toxic work environment. But if you have these elevated glucocorticoids, it makes your whole immune system like overactive because he says it's almost like they're preparing for battle. He's like, when you have a really high like battle, there's, it's more likely that good guys will get shot because everyone's like gun happy. Right. Well, and this it's goes like, back makes to, sense. Yes. And this goes back to Quran Krish, Krishnan or I'm yeah. not sure if he says last name, Kieran, but Krishnan, Michael yeah. Labs. Um, and he was saying that, you know, I popped my hand up when we heard him at that biohacking conference that we were at recently. And I was like asking about methane SIBO because one of my clients said that and I wanted to get his expert opinion. And I was like, wow. I mean, he was just yes. like, got to regulate the nervous system and all goes back. I know. I and I was like, dude, dude, yes. So much yep. freaking yes, because exactly that you very in this chronic fight or flight mode, which, Hey, that's emotional. And I don't, I haven't read why zebras don't get ulcers, but I have a feeling it's very similar to an aha moment that I had thanks to the COVID lockdown when I was walking around the lake here in my neighborhood that you walked around with me. Yes. And I, I was the only person out there. People were literally afraid to come out of their houses. This is in the beginning of the shutdown. I'm like, I'm the only person freaking outside. Seriously. Getting vitamin D that we're day no after helps day, yeah, day after day after day. I'm telling you, there was not a freaking soul. It was like no one lived in my neighborhood. It was insane. Every once in a while, I'd see like one person. And I was, so I had a lot of time outside by myself in nature. And I have it's a really big neighborhood. It's like thousands and thousands of people in this community. And I was watching the ducks in the lake and I will never, I mean, it just really, I'm just sitting by the lake and I'm watching these ducks. And I was thinking about all the time that I have walked by those ducks and seen a toddler or a dog or something chase after them. And what do they do? They freaking freak out. They ruffle all their yes, feathers. Yes, they fly yes. away. They're in a huge hussy. They go land across the lake and they go right back in the calm. So, and then I was like, look at us, look at all of us humans nothing bad is happening in 99% of these homes in their yes. actual immediate environment. None of these people are under distress. No, yeah, not, yeah, most, yeah. I don't think there was a case in Utah yet of, yeah. of COVID. Right. So I'm like, but all of these people, they are not being like those ducks. They are like all up in their stress response, super scared because of all of this stuff that's going on in our minds, not our actual environment. And I was like, wow, we have something to learn from animals is that so, yes. like be able to come back into peace when there is not an actual threat and realize how much of it is in our minds, like yes. worrying about what your mom's going to say at dinner this Sunday, when you go over for dinner that like, let it go meditate, yes. let stressful thoughts go and be like, right now I'm in my coffee, drinking my organic <laughs> coffee, yeah. you know, in my kitchen, yeah. drinking my coffee on Wi-Fi in this nice climate controlled environment, or I'm outside in the sunshine and enjoy nature. Yeah. So is that kind yeah. of what he's hitting on is like their ability to get out of this chronic stress response? Yeah. Yeah. Like it, I, I think, yeah. yeah, that's part of it. I mean, he goes into, there's multiple chapters on he ties the stress response to like many different diseases. And he shows you, he directly is like, okay, here's how stress causes high blood pressure. Here's how stress oh. increases heart disease. Here's right. how stress does this. But it all has to do with this overactive sympathetic nervous system. Yep. All of it. Like literally, you guys got to think about this, how we evolved. It's amazing that we have a sympathetic nervous system because we wouldn't be here otherwise. We would not be here, right? There was a time that we were hunter gatherers and we needed to be able to access the stress response to use it, right? So he says- yeah, guess what happens in the stress response? We know your heart rate increases because you need to get more blood to all of your limbs, right? So that's a beneficial thing, um, which makes actually temporarily blood pressure go up, but it should go back down, right? Yeah. But when it stays up all the time, you're going to actually cause that the arterial walls, you know, I mean, they, 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 it changes the, it changes yeah. the heart and then the heart disease. And cause it, Cause it's like, if you got to think about high blood pressure and the force of blood, like going through hard, it actually hits a part of the, the wall that makes it actually like, um, bigger. Right. So it makes it enlarge, which causes more chance of heart disease. And he goes into it, but it's so the, the book was so fascinating to me. I honestly think I had 20 aha moments and I wish we had time to go into all of them, but like, because he was just tying everything into these emotional things and he's a neuroscientist. So he even says, he's like, I'm a scientist. I'm very about the facts and stuff. But in some of it, he goes into, I couldn't help but like acknowledge the emotional aspect of all of this because uh -huh. I'm a scientist, but I see how it puts people in fight or flight. So you understand 
it's activating your, your nervous system. And think about it, guys, if we are, if we're going to be activated our nervous system by every email that we get or every text message that we get, like, that's not a good place to be. You need to take control of your life. So I'm just going to go into, there's a few things I've done in my life in the last six months that have literally, I feel like calmed my nervous system more than it ever has been. And one of them was turning off freaking notifications, dude. Like I turned off notifications for years. Yeah. And you're so smart. I should have done it, but I always felt like I needed to be like available to people and like stay in touch and all this stuff. Nope. I don't have (laughs) any notifications on. So I get to choose when I go on and say, cool, now I'm going to answer Instagram messages. Now I'm going to go on Facebook. Now I'm going to go on my email. Now I'm going to check my text messages. My clients know this too. They know that I will get back to them when I can get back to them. And they know that if they text me at 8 PM, there's no way I'm getting back to them. Like I go to bed early. Like we have the same, I went to sleep. I'm not even joking at seven 30 last night. I was so tired. I just got back from Moab and I was like, dude, if I'm tired, I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to wake up early. Like why, why not? You know, like, so if I can say anything, you absolutely have to learn how to, how to calm your nervous system. And that's going to take boundaries, like a lot of boundaries, like boundaries with your family, with your relationships, with your friends, with your coworkers, like boundaries, like don't be afraid of saying no to people or over committing or like, or just like not responding them to the next day. Like you're, they're not going to die. I promise. They're not going to hate you. I promise. Like that's all in your head. This like over worrying about like, Oh, what if I don't get right back to her and tell her I can't do it? Like who cares? Like we're all adults. Like boundaries you know in a nutshell I mean? are what do I want and what do I need? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And don't be afraid of them. Like, you know, me, I used to be like the world's biggest people pleaser. I swear. Like I used to have problems with it and I'd say yes to everyone. And I would help out. And I, I'm naturally like a helper. I love to heal people. Right. I love to help people. Right. But right. if you don't have boundaries, you have nothing to give. You like drained, your cup is empty. You have yeah. nothing to give people. And when I started setting boundaries in my life, which I'm still working on, I'm not going to lie. Like I'm still There's been like the things in the last few months that I've said to people and I immediately get like this gut, like, Oh, like, I can't believe I just said that. And I, and you know what you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't manage their reaction. I've had bad reactions. I'm not going to lie. I've had people react bad to me and I just look there and I'm like, "Mm, they're going to have to process this. And I'm, I don't, I'm not responsible for their reaction. Exactly. I'm not right. I don't care if it's hard news for them to hear. I'm not responsible for their reaction. I'm only responsible for my truth. And if I don't speak my truth, I start having all these like block throat chakra and then I have thyroid issues and then I get gut issues because my vagal tone is low. And it's like, if you're not willing to acknowledge that emotions affect our body, guys, they do. Like it's a sign, there's science about it now. You know what I mean? Because if you really understand your nervous system and how your nervous system is reacting to emotions, you figure it out. And if any of you guys have been listening to the podcast for a while, you may remember Dr. Robert Kozlowski. He's a functional medicine doctor, Jenny, who came out with a book called Unfunk Your Guts. And he, he wrote, he's an active, I mean, he's busy. He's got his own practice. He's got a family. He's like, you know what I mean? And he wrote this book purely because he was like, people do not understand the spiritual and emotional component of the gut. So he goes yeah. into all the physiological stuff, but he's like, I had to write the book because more people need to understand how much their emotions and their disconnection from spirituality, something, whatever that is for them, mm. affecting their gut health. Yeah. Yes. Well, so, and I love that. Cause do you remember really quick? Uh, so me and Tara obviously have been using a uh, Zach Bush's supplement called iron biome for a while. And I thought it was interesting because I read one, one of their um, research. I remember, I think I was talking to one of the um, staff cause we have friends that work there and they were saying that when they did a study with people and they were able to actually see when their gut was leaky versus healed. They even asked people like emotionally do you feel different and multiple people reported. I feel like I have better boundaries now. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. It's so crazy. It's so interrelated. I know. And you know, even though I didn't have any gut issues, I understand the science of ion biome and I like what he's doing there. It's basically in one is helping with get rid of the glyphosate, but mostly he's Zach is all about helping increase the communication of your cells, like get, helping yes. your gut do what it needs to do. And so I use it every day. My kids take it. I figure it can't hurt with all the glyphosate. And I definitely notice like an increase in gut motility yeah. and just feeling better in general. So even if you yeah. don't have gut issues, I really like ion biome. Well, yeah, your, your microbiome need to communicate with each other. Right. If I'm in one building and someone else is in the other building and we have no cell phone or no walkie talkie, how do we talk? Exactly. exactly. Right. So it's like, you need to increase the communication of your gut microbiome, your whole microbiome in your body. So all right. Well, we could go on forever. I Here's know and we do. And we do. <laughs> We're going to hit that hot spring and get all muddy pretty soon here. But yes. um, 
guys. So Jenny is like really big on TikTok right now. She's sharing some of uh, so much of this information on TikTok. So follow it's Jenny Lynn Fit, right? Yes. On, yep. On, on TikTok, TikTok yep. and also on Instagram. Um, but your TikTok has kind of become your like gut. Yeah. Hub. <laughs> TikTok yeah. is all gut health. My Instagram is kind of like a mix of fitness and travel, but like, and I'm right. starting to do gut, but it's like my soul gut is on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always on point. As you can see, she's just straight to the point, gets the information out there in a really clear, concise way. It's definitely your gift. So make sure you follow her on TikTok. And then your, um, you have a course for gut health. Yes. Now on gut it's actually, health. um, yeah. Guthealthforlife.com. And it's actually a membership site. So, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. So what happens is you just subscribe. Uh, there's no contract or anything, but you pay 39 bucks a month and then you just get one new course every month. So my oh. first course is just intro to gut health. So I can actually explain yes. why the connection to the gut, how it works and everything. And then the next course that is up is all about leaky gut and how to heal leaky gut. And then my next course that I'm releasing in two weeks is uh, how to heal candida. So awesome. So yeah, guthealthforlife.com. We'll put it in the show notes. Thank Anywhere you. else you want to direct people, Jenny? That's it. Honestly, guthealthforlife.com and my TikTok are the main gut avenues I have right now. So I would love awesome. to, for, to follow me on there. So, okay. Awesome. You raw girlfriend. Thank you so thank much you. for coming on and being all nerdy with us today. I, I know love it. I got a lot out of that. I did as well. So thank you. Thank you. Love you.